These days, so many podcast hosts just riff through unprepared segments until they get to the next ad break for pills they know nothing about, cheap razors, and whatever else they can get a buck from. But the Higher Side Chats does it differently. We succeed or fail on the quality of the content and your desire to hear more of it. So you're about to hear another free first hour episode that's here to prove the two hour shows are worth subscribing for. Five shows a month for just $8. Members get a mobile friendly website, a decade of archives, a dedicated RSS feed for the best podcast apps, and a lot deeper discussion that a single hour can allow for. Sponsor free with more for thee. Get a free seven-day trial of THC Plus at thehiresidechats.com. Enjoy! In the 1930s, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt addressed the nation through a series of radio broadcasts known as the Fireside Chats. His aim was to reassure the common man that our society would recover from its troubled times. Well, we're far from 1930, and I deal with a different kind of fire. For a new era of worldly frustration, we offer a fresh conversation. I'm Greg Carlwood, and these are the Higher Side Chats. Brace yourself for another wild ride from sunny San Diego. I'm Greg Carlwood, and right now it feels as if we have enough political scandals and corruption sagas to last us a lifetime. But just beyond the big circus clown show, there are mysterious paranormal places and strange beings that continue to defy logic. Are they helping us, hurting us, taking our children, extracting our genetic material, guardians of the forest, beings from beneath the surface, leftover energy from occultists that didn't close the ritual right, or life forms clawing their way into this dimension from somewhere else? Have they made deals with the capstone cabal, or do they see no need? We hear all sorts of perspectives from all sorts of experiencers and researchers, and it feels like you can still make a good case for all these things and more. And of all the hotbeds for such activity, none is quite as well known or well studied as the infamous Skinwalker Ranch in Utah. Well, today we're talking once again to the man who owns a property that neighbors Skinwalker Ranch, has hosted members of the Invisible College on their research trips, including Jacques Vallée, and has been conducting his own research into what's going on in this strange landscape, why government scientists, deep state contractors, occultists, and aerospace engineers are so preoccupied with it, and what they might know about it. He's the host of the Hero Paranormal podcast, and since we last spoke on air in 2019, he's learned a lot more about the place and even started his own company, Space Wolf Research, LLC. He's written a lot about the area in his books, The Utah UFO Ranch and Shapeshifter Territory, and I'm certainly psyched to dive back in and get an update from our man on the ground, the Skinwalker Ranch researcher, hero paranormal podcaster, and certified space wolf, Ryan Patrick Burns. Welcome back. Thank you, Greg, and appreciate the wonderful introduction, man. Can't be beat. Love those introductions. Thank you. Thank you. This is great, man. Our first interview was back in the much simpler world of 2019, and since that time, you have been kind enough to send me little bits of information here and there, and we even have you to thank for a couple of the Paranormally shows we've done since then with people like Ryan Musgrave Evans and Trey Hudson, so thanks for that. Back in 2019, there wasn't a show about it yet, and the Skinwalker Ranch was just in the process of changing hands, although actually this seems to have happened much earlier. According to the wiki, in 2016, Bigelow sold Skinwalker Ranch to Adamantium Real Estate LLC, which you did tell us. And then after this purchase, roads leading to the ranch were blocked and the perimeter was guarded by cameras and barbed wire and signs were posted that aimed to prevent people from approaching the ranch, it says. In March 2020, Utah real estate tycoon Brandon Fugel, who you were calling just the Wolverine back then, actually announced ownership of the ranch. So there we have it. We know the guy's name, and we know he probably did all this trademarking of the term Skinwalker Ranch to try to capitalize on the TV show. Well, bring us up to speed. How have things changed since we last spoke? What insights can you give us from living next door that we wouldn't get anywhere else? Yeah, a ton has changed, as you said, since 2019. July of 2019, I purchased sort of a base camp 
known as Space Wolf Research LLC. It's adjacent there to the south border. And it's interesting because since then, obviously, a lot has come forward that is no longer guarded or considered things that should be kept in the shadows so we can speak more openly about it, such as the owner's name, who I called the Wolverine, that is Brandon. And the paranormal reputation of the area located there in Uinta County, it's popularly dubbed the most scientifically studied hotspot in the world. And a lot of the folklore surrounding the area for decades comes from NIDS, the National Institute of Discovery Science, who was under Robert Bigelow's control and whose members did a ton of research there, a lot of which, believe it or not, was occult. And by that, I mean the use of Ouija boards and other occult practices because they were getting they were getting data. They were getting data. So for somebody like me, this really stirs the pot. <laughs> and you have people such as the quote-unquote father of non-lethal weaponry, Colonel John Alexander, who was studying there on the property, was obviously tied to the government and also working with NIDS. And we have strange goings-on, such as cattle mutilations that have been part of the folklore in the surrounding area for decades. And with the new ownership, Adamantium Real Estate, we have, obviously, after this purchase, a very popularized and well-received television show. So things have changed a lot. You know, we used to have some of the ultimate spooks and extreme occult practices taking place on the property in secret, finding things out. What is interesting is whatever Bigelow did find out, he gave not one iota to the new owner, and he made that very clear in the documentation that zero data would be transferred. And this is kind of a mark of Bigelow's, the type of business he does. He's very, very serious about his research. And I believe the ranch was just a tool with which he was able to gather whatever research data he needed for his next conquest, which it seems like he's taken on a quite larger thing now with BICS, B-I-C-S, B -I -C -S, which is basically a study for consciousness, mm -hmm. Bigelow Institute for Consciousness Studies. And BICS is really asking the deepest, darkest, hardest questions humanity has. Why are we here? Is there life after death? and what is really going on in the greater scheme of things. So it's very consciousness-based. And since my purchase of Space Wolf Research, that base camp on the South Boundary, I started sort of meeting interesting people, as is usually the case with these things. I met a very interesting person who has desired to remain unnamed, and I met him through a mutual friend, Jeremy Corbell, and this gentleman is from back east, and he was also interested in investigating and studying sort of this consciousness aspect and doing so through technological means. As many know, there are technologies that lend themselves to consciousness studies, such as the God Helmet, which is basically a helmet that was designed by Dr. Persinger, if you've come across that. And it was originally designed to help stroke victims and the like. However, there's a strange connection in Persinger's career, how this led up to this photobiomodulation helmet type technology. And the strange thing is, when you put this technology on, a great deal of the people who wear the quote unquote God helmet have spiritual experiences. So it really asks the question, you know, what is going on? Is this all in our heads or are our heads able to gather and grasp things that our regular senses cannot? Mm -hmm. 
And this gentleman, I ended up selling him 14 acres of the property. And he has also delved into Anja Lamp type studies while after purchasing the property. And that is an interesting technology as well. The Anja Lamp is basically a technology that can also be used for consciousness studies and is said to mimic the effects of DNT, yet in a technological form, something you can switch on and off without the long drawn out, not to mention biological repercussions. And he sets up a tent, for lack of a better word, a very dark, light proof tent on the premises and fires up these technologies, this Anja Lamp technology, which interestingly is said to have been invented or created by a Catholic priest who claims he channeled all the information on how to create it. Didn't have the background really to do it. So <laughs> that's very interesting. Oh, yeah. But yeah, the property, it's been just an array of strange activity on my side of the fence, as well as my close friends, who is basically doing his thing on the other side. We still have a very open door policy with one another. And he's gathered a lot of information as well. And since July of 2019, when I originally purchased the property, I've added some acreage to it since heading towards the east, which is actually pretty exciting. That happened this year. And we've had some pretty unbelievable, unexplainable events take place. Hell yeah. Give us an example of like one of those events. Okay. The most mind blowing. Well, it sounds kind of cheesy to say that you have the objects in the sky basically all the time, which I think I've sent you some of those images, but I can send you more. It's a pretty fairly common scenario that you have these unidentified aerial phenomena during the day or at night that's quite easily caught on camera. Mm -hmm. And that's evidence in itself. But then you have other strange things. For example, a cabin and a 40-foot RV that I placed on the property was vaporized during the day by quite literally a bolt of energy. So something akin to a lightning bolt. And by vaporized, I mean, the only things left were literally molten metal, glass on the ground, nothing left of this 40 foot massive RV. And I had a exploration team out just the weekend before Kreider exploration. And then I was supposed to be out there actually when this thing hit, but I got backed up and thank goodness I wasn't there. So that happened. And in almost the same area or same location, we had basically, I brought in a large 40 foot steel container to place all the technology in kind of a quick fix, be able to lock it all up. And I placed it in roughly the same location also to test and see if it too would be hit by lightning. And it has not been hit by lightning. I don't believe that that's a common thing in the middle of the day. But what has happened is that 40 foot long, 8,700 pound container was quite literally moved from a east-west facing direction to a north-south facing direction and almost just for fun. Damn. It seemed to be airlifted. It appears that there are no tire marks, drag marks, any telltale signs, not even so much as a blade of grass seemed disturbed. It was just no longer facing east to west. It's now facing north to south. And it's stuff like that that just really kind of keeps me interested. Yeah, yeah, those are interesting bits of information. But what about contact with whatever this is? I'm still unsure if it's a portal place where multiple types of intelligences seem to bleed in or if there's one big entity. I talked to Greg Little after the release of his last book that he wrote with Andrew Collins, and Andrew Collins says he thinks that it is a blanket of consciousness that kind of covers the whole area as if it's one big etheric entity. And that's a perspective that is interesting, but I, I really just don't know. And I'm curious your thoughts. 
and if there's been any mind-to-mind communication where we can get a sense of if it's one thing, if it's many things, and what the logic is and agenda is of this otherworldly force. Such a great question, Greg. You never underestimate with the questions. (laughs) Well, I'm just figuring, let's get into it. Let's do it. Let's roll up our sleeves. And I'm glad you asked that question because it is one of those larger questions that much like NIDS under Bigelow, diving into the cult to get these answers, I've also done somewhat of a deep dive, especially literally into literature with Navajo witchcraft, Native American skinwalker witchcraft and related phenomena, reading books by Clyde Cluckhone, Joan Teller, Norman Blackwater, really hard to find texts that delineate step by step what these dark adepts are doing to achieve this shape-shifting quote-unquote biological technology that they assume in their witchcraft. And to get back to your question as far as what it is we're dealing with, I think that, I love Gregory Little, by the way, I think that he is right in one aspect that this is a blanket of consciousness or intelligence. However, I think that it merges in a way that is difficult to explain, much like the Bible speaks of the gods as the Elohim, yet the Elohim are also what make up the Godhead. So it is sort of one and the same, and I find that it gets super tricky because you have all of these negative and positive malevolent and benevolent activities that can take place in the area. And there is a trickster mentality to a lot of the malevolent, but there's also something I like to call it friends. When I go to the area, I gathered that from someone else, that term. And when I asked, why do you call them friends? He said, well, it's better than calling them enemies. And I think that's very true. You have to go in with an open mind, set boundaries, be very protected. No matter what your religion is, you have to say prayers of protection, say, I'm willing to engage, engage with the phenomena or the intelligence, this non corporeal intelligence of sorts, which is precognitive, which makes it very difficult to engage with because it can know your settings and what you're thinking literally before you do it. So it's quite precognitive and it kind of sees you coming a mile away. Mm -hmm. But it does appear that this intelligence of sorts has not only a sense of humor, which is super awesome, but this aspect of liking to play the game. It has this trickery mentality, almost childlike at times, where it just wants to engage. And that I get. In the bigger scheme of things, just the fact that there's contact whatsoever is so phenomenal to me, but yet the fact that it wants it Mm -hmm. makes it not easier. It makes it a little harder because you don't know where it's going with this particular contact each time it occurs. And to give you an example, on a recent trip, and I actually took my mother on this trip, we had kind of bedded down for the night in this small cabin there at the base camp at Space Wolf. And we hear some sounds outside. And it sounds like my car doors opening and closing, which this is nothing special. These types of trickery mechanisms happen quite often, but they don't always lead somewhere. So I got up, I said, Oh, mom, it sounds like somebody's getting into my car. And I said, But don't worry, it probably isn't. It's probably just messing around. And it's no big deal. And I went out the front door. And I noticed these lights swirling around the vehicle. Of course, as I turned to close the door and come out and really investigate, there's no lights. They disappear. They vanish. And then in the distance, not too far away, I would say about 20 yards, 15 yards, I see a spotlight come out from around the angular corner of this container, this 40-foot container that we spoke of. 
and it looks like a flashlight coming down from the top corner of the container towards the ground. And so I say, well, maybe there is somebody out here. I walk over towards this beam of light and there is zero point of origin. As I try to come around angularly around the corner of the container, it evades ever so slightly as so I can never see a point of origin. Now, when I get too close, it will turn off and there's zero beam of light. By now, my mom has gotten up to see what's going on. She's come out onto the little porch, and she sees the inside of the car, all of the dash and screens, etc., inside the vehicle, are emanating colors that are not usual for the vehicle, like very bright, different rainbow-colored colors. So she thinks I'm in the car. It had a very heavy tint on the vehicle, so she went up to the window, and looked inside and could tell I was not in the vehicle, and then looked over, and I'm, I'm standing in this beam of light, because at this point, I literally just went to stand in the beam of light to see if I could feel anything. And I noticed that I could not cast a shadow in this beam of light. So I called her over, and I'm like, Mom, you got to check this out. This is so awesome. So she came over, could not believe her eyes. I said, get in, get in. There's nothing to worry about. Look at this. You can't cast a shadow no matter how low you go. And if we try to follow around this container to see where this beam is coming from, it will either turn off, move, or always remain just inches out of sight. So the light has zero point of origin. And she engaged and saw this all take place. She's a very Hispanic lady born in Costa Rica. She's very familiar with witchcraft. And after the event, because eventually, you know, she's like, this is just too much. This is just too much. She starts, you know, praying and stuff. And I told her, Mom, don't pray too much. You know, like, like <laughs> we don't want to completely disengage. But she got the point that there's something that relates the phenomena to us. And it just wants that engagement, that playful, much like a puppy or a dog. It just wants to engage. Great story. I'm sure that these things are really impactful to experience firsthand, but we've heard many stories at this level of trickster activity and doors opening and closing and strange lights. Has there been any, you said it's capable of mind-to-mind -mind communication or reading one's mind. Has this entity communicated anything to you when asked, what are you? How did you get here? What do you want? I mean, these have to be the first questions that come to mind. Has it ever given you any response or have you talked to someone firsthand who's gotten a response to those kind of questions? Yes, on both accounts. It seems as if for whatever reason, this entity is somewhat stuck or enjoys being in this location or general area. And it's difficult to find out exactly why it is banished to this area, stuck in this area, or chooses to roam this particular spot and does so kind of with reckless abandon. It has full control of the area. And what I mean by that is quite literally it almost appears and seems as if the very ground itself is alive or has a consciousness to it. As soon as dark hits and you get that magic time from dusk to night, it exponentially just energizes the area. And it's something that you can physically feel. Being human beings, we have that biological kind of sensor in us that, you know, the hairs go up on your neck, you know, you're not alone, you hear things that shouldn't be heard, you see things that shouldn't be seen. But more importantly, you realize that it's quite clearly the domain of something else that you are just a visitor there. And that is mesmerizing to me. I do feel at times like things could go very wrong with a lot of good reasons. But I think if you 
are very careful, respectful of the area, and playful in a congenial and not, I don't need to prove anything to anybody other than myself. So I already believe. So when, when I go, it just seems like they're kind of like the edge is taken off. Like I'm not going to have a psychic break because I see something that was next level to what I saw the previous time. So my history in the area possibly makes me a little bit more desensitized, but still engaging with it. It's a rush. It is a complete rush. How the actual landscape itself can become alive with a type of consciousness. And at times, the earth itself will move, it will shake, it will shudder, it will rumble. And another very strange thing that happens is you'll have these cracks in the ground that will completely open up. And some of these caverns or cracks, and this is just regular desert landscape, high desert, some of them will go down 20 to 50 feet. I mean, massive and be three feet wide, four feet wide at the surface. And within days, they'll close up and you'll never even know they were there. So it's quite literally as if the ground is alive. Yeah, very fascinating. And it does jive with things previous guests have talked about here. I mean, animism, the perspective that all objects can be uh, bound with consciousness, that even rocks and elements of the landscape have consciousness. We've talked about guardian spirits before and fairies and all that folklore. Some people think Bigfoot is still a guardian of the forest to some degree. And Dr. Little talked about geological activity being a component of what facilitates maybe these plasma discharges and that either the plasma itself is conscious or... Maybe these beings live in plasma like a fish lives in water. And when plasma emerges, the intelligence is just in there from another dimension or whatever. That's obviously why the term portal is used. So when you say it's bound to the area, that obviously is occult language. And it speaks to maybe something that you'd find in Dr. Little's book, like a big shamanic ritual. and Magic is always kind of about binding or, you know, you draw the circle, the bean is invoked, and then it can't leave the circle. So the notion that something was once called there and can't really escape but doesn't hate it, I don't know, maybe that makes sense, like a little trickster in a regional prison of some kind without real bars. Yeah, I'm open to a lot of that. It seems to make sense. But have you asked it, what are you? Does it ever describe itself? Is it an angel? Is it a, a spirit? Is it, what does it say it is? And this is a good question. It does not, at least that I've been convinced by, and even in conversations with people who have had unusual impressions as well of the intelligence, name itself accordingly. However, it does seem to have many attributes that are shared with other occult beings that are deemed extremely powerful. And the immediate one that comes to mind is the jinn. And the reason I bring up the jinn is this is also not my idea. I originally was told this idea by Jacques Vallée. He and Frank Salisbury and Junior Hicks would have conversations. And in Frank Salisbury's very difficult to get, but very good book on the phenomenon called the Utah UFO Display, it becomes apparent that even though these scientists are looking at this through the traditionally scientific lens, that it quite quickly and inexplicably borders on spiritualism at some point. You can't look at this from just the scientific lens. 
standard science only gets so far before it's outgunned, so to speak. And Mr. Valet quite literally told me, he said, very similar things are happening in the deserts of the Middle East and entities with similar capabilities doing similar things and having similar approaches are being witnessed in, again, the deserts. And it's strange that the desert comes up so often because in many occult ancient texts, when someone wants to gain answers from a magical perspective, they are told to go to the desert. And this is where you will find the great teacher, for example, many other names and anecdotal terminology. But basically, it's reported through a lot of ancient texts that the deserts have this intelligence. And the standard scientific approach just has a really hard time wrapping its head around that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds like some I am that which is called I am kind of thing. Like, it's just a consciousness, a spirit that's like, what do you mean? What am I? I am. I am what I am. I'm right here. I'm, I'm communicating with you. Like, I don't really have a word for it here. You know, whatever you're looking for, I don't have that answer. I'm just, you're going to learn about me from the interactions. And I guess that's what we have to go on. And I wanted to ask you about this guy, Chris Marks, someone you interviewed that you recommended that I interview as well, but I just haven't gotten to it. Apparently he worked for Bigelow Advanced Aerospace Studies is a military policeman with active clearances and was a security guard for Skinwalker Ranch. What did you learn from him? Through a series of conversations, and there's another Chris involved, which was also a quote-unquote guard for Bigelow, and his name was Chris Bartell. Interestingly, these are the guys that I was literally, you know, running from years ago and these are the guys that were posted up outside of my house and in black suburbans when i was being quote unquote monitored and what's fun about talking to them now is that we can laugh about it they're like yeah you know we were asked to park outside of your house and keep an eye on you and this was well within the range of possibility for a private company which had deals with the Department of Defense. This is all plausible deniability and completely within, you know, they knew I was in the area. They knew what I was up to. And so anyway, it's kind of funny to look back on it. But yes, I found a lot out from these two gentlemen. And the stories detailed and the claims that have been made by both of them are 100% true, in my opinion. One particular story that comes to mind is a quote unquote shapeshifter at the property on the ridge, which spooked one of them because he felt as if he was being watched. He turned and looked up and he saw a person, just a Native American walking along the ridge, kind of shadowing him. And when he engaged with this individual and called out to him, it, I say it, but this individual, what appeared to be a Native American man, average build, bent over as if folded in half. So kind of like touching your toes. And then quite quickly became a wolf right in front of his eyes. And obviously, this made him a believer. Other events that took place were these three wolves that would kind of pack up. And there have been some instances that have happened that I'll get into. But a lot of times these things will roam in threes. And I say these things, but these wolf-like shape-shifting entities. And they engaged with one of these down by a waterway and unloaded on it, but by no means killed it. The bullets seemed to have no effect, which is quite often the case and goes along with a lot of the folklore you hear, which is unbelievable. And these are guys that don't lie. These are guys that, in my opinion, were just doing a job. You know, they're just collecting a paycheck. 
making car payments, making mortgage payments, and they're not really wanting any trouble. But the thing that stood out to me the most was the way they were engaging with the trickster, the types of games and playful back and forth, and the occult means by which they were doing so. So they had a custom Ouija board made specifically for the property. And these two gentlemen said that when they would touch the Ouija board together, that it would almost outpower them. Like they couldn't stop this thing from telling them things at times, even if they wanted to. And these are two big, beefy guys. So in an attempt to contact the entity and kind of go out on a limb, they realized the whole tree was literally shaking. The power was so real they couldn't deny it. And the occult ways that they contacted it, I think says a lot about the area, and it may say a lot about what possibly might be there. Hmm. Yeah, and you also mentioned to me that he was originally from Germany, and Robert Bigelow had him translate German submarine messages accounting for an anomalous expedition to Antarctica looking into odd things. Can you elaborate on that? What odd things? Yes, this is very strange. At first, he thought, why am I reading through all these pages? translating something that seems monotonous and has no meaning. And what he found was this was an event that took place. And it may have been UFO related, I'm not sure. And it may have something to do with the hollow earth. And that's kind of what I gathered from our conversation. There were instances in the accounts where the submarine was running deep, finding things that were out of this world and engaging with things that were, again, not the usual. So even though I didn't get an exact answer, I believe it was UFO related and possibly having to do with Hollow Earth. Hmm. Well, what was like the most revealing aspect of, of what he told you because we've heard that the germans were looking in antarctica we've heard that they were interested in the hollow earth what can you tell us beyond what we might already know it did have something to do with foo fighters as they were known and it seemed as if they were either not quite attacking the submarine, but, and I'm sure that this stuff is confidential, I just don't know to what end, but they were investigating something in the area that was near South America. There were events taking place which had to do with UFOs, and apparently the information gathered was very important to Robert Bigelow, so much, in fact, that he had him translate this entire paperwork that came with the submarine. So it was very detailed, very much quite the process to go through it all, a lot of detail in the story. But where it was leading was that there was some sort of interaction as we sometimes in this country believe there is interaction of sorts between governments or collusion between governments and UFOs, that conspiracy that governments and these others are working together. And this stuff's always kind of held in these black vaults, cover-ups, controversies, and it's difficult to know how much of it is accurate and how much isn't. Mm -hmm. Well, fair enough. And, you know, of course, our interactions originally started with a THC plus forum post you made offering up an NDA free Skinwalker show. And then you showed me images of a portal that was pretty compelling. And funny enough, after the Trey Hudson interview, the researcher he mentioned from Turkey that uh, I had meant that came out in the interview that reached out to him actually popped up in the plus forum as well, offering to answer some questions. So that was an interesting 
coincidence. And going back to our last interview, you had mentioned that you yourself did an invocation of Thoth out there. And you told me recently that the avenue that you're looking more at is the connection between witchcraft and UFOs. And you had said that there are similarities between witchcraft used for healing and cursing in Central America, mostly Costa Rica, where you were born, and the skinwalkers of the Unitaw Basin. And this is the direction a lot of people are going. The trail seems to be much less sci-fi and much more metaphysical, esoteric, and occult. But for people who aren't familiar with Central American witchcraft for healing and cursing, what are the specific similarities that you see? Yeah, there are, for example, for lack of a better word, things found on the landscape. And this is similar to in Costa Rica, for example, there is a, a very long history of witchcraft. In fact, some of the cities, you can't go a block without passing two or three. It's like psychics, you know, two or three witches, which people know of. And you know, there are, of course, the white witches and the dark witches, which this will come into play shortly because you have the same exact thing in Native American cultures. And what I find is at times you'll visit the property and come across gifts is what I like to call them, but things that... Offerings. Offerings, yes. Great. Yes offerings that should not be there and seem to be created just for you and other times you will have things taken you will literally have an object a personal object of yours taken i recently bought i hate buying new electronics i had bought the new iphone i went up to the property and the thing disappears and i'm to not go too off topic i start trying to ping the device with my other Apple products. And it's pinging in completely different counties each time I do it, bouncing around. And then we hear it literally at the bottom of a backpack in the vehicle. Now, this is impossible because we had the phone with us the entire evening. We hadn't gone into the vehicle. It was morning and we were in the cabin. And I had, I had the phone right next to me. So obviously impossible and paranormal. But the fact that it was pinging in different counties made me wonder, is this actually dimensional? Like it didn't know where to put it. But we did find the phone eventually in the car at the bottom of a backpack where it couldn't have been. But it will take things from you. And if you're not able to ping these devices, you'll probably never find them. An interesting story with this particular phone is I should have learned my lesson, but that morning I decided to go out and take some pictures by this little waterway we call Cryptid Creek. And I was walking and I felt as if something just grabbed or pushed the phone out of my hand. It went in the water, obviously done deal. The water was high and moving very quickly. The phone was gone. Well, fast forward a few months, the water level was lower. I was looking for the device, and I found the device upstream from where I lost it, which again is paranormal. So you'll have things taken from you, which witches will do. In Native American and Navajo witchcraft, it's very common to guard things such as hair. You'll notice that many, especially elders, both in Hispanic cultures and in Native American cultures, will clean off their combs when they're done combing their hair and throw it in the garbage. They won't leave a strand of hair in their comb when they put it back. Because if someone with dark adept tendencies breaks into your house and they're able to gather so much as a strand of hair, they have sort of a screenshot of you. They have a piece of you, quite literally, that they can then work with. And related phenomena can build upon that. So there's a lot of different examples of that, but that's just a quick and kind of cliff notes way to explain it. Right on, right on. Well, man, we had planned to talk more about PB Randolph and let that be the bulk of the show, but even just getting some updates on Skinwalker Ranch has taken almost the full hour. But let's squeeze in some PB Randolph here. 
So if we follow along the occult lead laid out, you mentioned to me a deep study of this guy, P.B. Randolph, who was the partial basis for Doctor Strange in the Marvel Universe. He was the real first hashish importer into the U.S. and founder of the oldest secret society in America. He's kind of lost to history because he was a black man in the time of slavery. And that's one hell of a resume already. But tell us more and why this guy is important. Super important guy. He had so many of the founding ideas and philosophies that were taken by people such as H.B. Blavatsky. Thelema uses a lot of the ideas. He was a sex magician, but was definitely interesting character. He took an active part in the abolitionist movement. Randolph's Enlightenment was way ahead of its time, apparently. And in his Rosicrucian order, quote unquote, the White Brotherhood, he included, but was not limited to, members such as Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Paine, Abraham Lincoln, which was a personal friend. And these names were kept in an anonymity, but everybody sort of knew. Randolph was invited to go to New Orleans with Abraham Lincoln and for some sort of revitalization effort of philanthropy, he went and was trying to get certain blacks the ability to vote, things like that, and landed him in a ton of what he was always landing in a whirlwind of conflict and controversy. But he was a physician and he would use a great deal of hashish and basically trance work. He seemed to be a clairvoyant physician. So he had thousands of people who claimed to have been healed by him. You would go and see him. He would go into this trance-like state and find out what was really wrong with you. The way I found out about his organization back East, as well as others, is I had a conversation with Jay Parker. And after delving pretty deeply into satanic ritual abuse back East, you know, Jay was telling me everywhere to go, what to see, what to do. And I decided to book an air flight back East to Arden, Delaware, the place Joe Biden was raised in a place called Rose Valley to investigate claims of satanic ritual abuse by the dark side of the Illuminati. Much like in the Native American and Hispanic witchcraft, there's the dark side and the light side, apparently. And I was told to visit a specific dinner theater at specific times, and also a neighborhood called Roylandcroft. I probably shouldn't even say the name of the neighborhood, but amongst others, there's some others that I won't say the name of. And I did this to delve into specific locations and evidentiary ritual sites by the informants I was talking to. Jay Parker was one of them. Many of these neighborhoods are said to be 90% of the people living there are said to be 90% satanic and taking part in many dark SRA style gatherings or satanic ritual abuse, usually dealing with children. So I was kind of, you know, fired up about this and I wanted to get out there and look. You know, I've always been interested in other groups that do this sort of thing and I wanted to see if this is very real. Obviously, the when I went out there, the Pizzagate thing was huge and Pedogate and all of that. So what I found was tragic. I now 100% believe the words and claims of Jay Parker and many others. And to give you an idea, some of the things I witnessed, I saw children being ushered into bottom levels of a dinner theater, a place they had no reason to be, especially at the time I was told to see it. I saw massive ovens in the woods behind the homes of elites where the bodies are said to be thrown and disposed of. Again, no reason for these massive ovens to be there. And I was chased out of certain neighborhoods just for stopping on the side of the road as I was told I would be. I didn't believe it. You know, they said, do not stop. And even though I'm in the business of real estate and I'm not a big deal, but I made the appropriate calls. I dressed appropriately in a suit, as well as having business cards on me. I was not allowed to view estates that were listed for sale and some of the properties in the purported hotspots 
of satanic control. One angry lady came up to my vehicle right as I stopped and almost immediately asked, who do you know here? And when I responded, explaining I was just looking to buy a property, I gave her my business card. She threatened me with physical harm, said others would join her if I did not leave immediately. Anyway, I also found workers of the good, quote unquote, Illuminati variety and the brethren of light, which it's referred to. So anyway, I digress. Sorry for being tangential. Back to Randolph. That's all I, good. <laughs> Randolph believed that the inhabitants of the soul worlds have much to do with the goings on of the great world's future. So a lot like the entities we're talking about in the Uinta Basin, that there was this hierarchy of entities that sort of worked together, much like the Greeks explained in their mythology, and that they did so oftentimes by using mortals. So when you have these horrible, horrific things that you say, how could a person possibly do that? Well, it might not be a person doing that. It may be some of these other entities working through a person to do these things. And the same can be said on the light side. So anyway, Randolph consciously experienced all kinds of angelic realms and hierarchies and visions. He had extreme advocacy of hashish. As you said, he was the number one importer of hashish. He also created magic mirrors. And he put the tools in the hands of just about anybody who wanted to experience these visions and states described by seers for millennia. So Randolph was definitely the beginning of this foundation, this old secret society, this Rosicrucian order. And his occult progress had a lot to do with the will, not the intellect so much, but the will to interact with these entities and to try and that kind of became his motto and his trademark to try to become your best self very interesting yeah i read a, quite a bit about him preparing for this you mentioned sex magic he actually wrote a book called magica sexualis and the amazon description says this book explains Randolph's meticulous science of sex magic practiced by the Brotherhood of Euless and the Hermetic Brotherhood of Light. Beginning with exercises to develop essential skills, the book explains the step-by-step -step details of how to perform sex magic rituals for specific results, such as greater strength or enhancement of the senses, how to charge or use a vault, an effigy, for a specific person you want to influence or protect, how to enliven a painting in order to influence those around it, and how to create magical talismans with specific planetary forces using what Randolph calls fluid condensers. This work shows that true power of the spirit is acquired in conjunction with the power of sex, affirming that sex is the fundamental force in every being, the most powerful force in nature, and the most characteristic evidence of God. Well, how about that? Right there on Amazon. For anyone to see, secrets in plain sight. So you go out there and you follow Jay Parker's advice and you see some things that convince you that the darkness in this area is real. Well, talk to us more about the light side or why that connects to P.B. Randolph and his deep history, I suppose, in that area. Sure. Yeah, Randolph was, by all means, a Rosicrucian through and through. And he, with the founding of his organization, the Third Temple of the Rosy Cross, which began with the initiation of like 12 adepts and is not only the oldest Rose Cross secret society in the United States, but it is also what is known as the Brotherhood of Light. And I spoke to the juxtaposing brethren, let's say, a brethren of the shadows, as they're known, and dark adepts of Arden, Delaware, and Rose Valley, Pennsylvania. And these two organizations are completely on the opposite spectrums of this quote-unquote battle between good and evil. And Mark Passio can affirm my claims that only workers of light are involved with the organization in the order P.B. Randolph started in Pennsylvania. 
Now, every ying has to have sort of a yang, even in the quote unquote Illuminati, which is sort of a catch all term for these Illuminists. And after my trips to Rose Valley and Arden, Delaware, to delve into this super deeply, I found that the darkness was very real, but I also found that the light was very real. And Mark, as I mentioned, and myself, no members of this group, these light working Illuminists, and I can verify that they are sort of the tip of the spear fighting against the dark side of the quote unquote Illuminati. And the late Bill Cooper believed without a doubt that this group was the most powerful in the United States from a magical perspective. But although Bill always seemed to believe that absolute power corrupted absolutely, I'm not entirely sure. It is true that there would probably be no escaping the eventual blasphemous truth of the Gnostic theory of the Demiurge eventually, because that's very common. But again, as I said, I'm not so sure a powerful, omnipotent being wouldn't be able to fulfill the job description that they're built for. I don't know. Not my place to say. Either way, Randolph's Rosicrucian roots began in 1852. He began his official order with 12 adepts, with the first ground lodge founded in August of 1857, known as the August Fraternity, and the great spiritual philosophical systems that the Rosicrucians have used ever since Germany and ancient Greece and before that Egypt, they preach of these cataclysms that destroy previous civilizations, such as Noah's flood. And Randolph believed that the diurnal and orbital motions of the earth were one thing, but he also believed it was a fact that there was an oscillating motion. So kind of going back to the Uinta Basin, that there were other movements taking place in this living being called the planet. And basically, Randolph started something. He started something very interesting way ahead of his time. He traveled all over Europe and the Middle East, Turkey, searching for these adepts of different magical sorts to try to gather his own description of what it meant to be a magician or a sorcerer. And he picked up a lot of masterful things. His mom apparently married one of the famous Randolphs, fairly elite for the time. And this was a guy that sort of abandoned the family. P.B. Randolph's father took no role in raising him, abandoned him to the streets in New York. So even though he kind of came from this finer cloth, he didn't get any of the perks. And... Randolph supposedly became aware of his father's death by purely clairvoyant means, but as a child, Randolph lost his mother during the cholera epidemic of 1831-32. He would spend nights on the street, basically as a beggar, found a place called Bellevue Hospital where he was taken, and he spent quite a while in this stone building on Manhattan Island as you know, a very sad youth. So he had a lot of pain in his life early on. And I think this is where he sort of kindled this fire within him to go and find out all of the mysteries of the world and become more than what he believed he was. And he was put to work really young, you know, going door to door, soliciting items for sale. He picked up kind of being a master of marketing and self-promotion, which came pretty handy later in life when he took to traveling and being in the circles of these mystics and mesmerists. He would go to France and performed before Napoleon III. And even though the term sex magician has a very negative connotation, I think mostly due to Aleister Crowley's abuse of this term and his quest to detach from his guardian angel, which is a whole other story, I believe Randolph's medical views on sex healing were sort of part of his universal views and theories of spiritualism and magic of vital human energies. I mean, realistically, that's the closest that people become to being a god is, or a creator is to be able to create life. It's such a magical thing. I think he saw that. 
And even though he practiced all kinds of medicine and used magic crystals and scrying mirrors, he always sort of in the background believed in this energy between male and female energy being able to upload a higher mystical experience. Hmm. Yeah, I've done a couple of shows recently that have pretty much convinced me the big secret is using the energy of sex for magical purposes. And just to cruise through some of the things that you told me about Randolph or that I learned preparing for this, you said Bill Cooper was convinced that this Rosicrucian order founded in the U.S. by Randolph in 1856 was the most powerful hidden group in the U.S., and that's kind of what sets you on your trail. He was married to a Native American named Mary Jane. Some think that's where the association started. I liked that little anecdote. You said Abraham Lincoln, Benjamin Franklin, and Thomas Paine were all members. And I also learned that he used a cannabis preparation called Dawa Mesh, a.k.a. the medicine of immortality for occult powers like scrying with magic mirrors. And that's interesting. I wonder what makes up that specific cannabis preparation. But regardless, I have to squeeze this in here to the first hour. I can't really leave it where we are because otherwise I'm just going to get raked over the coals. But I obviously have a little skepticism when you say, you know, there's the dark side of things and then there's the light side. Not that I don't think that there are light magicians, but I just don't know how well organized they are. And I don't know if they really have any power in today's world because I would ask to see the evidence of their light work because no human sacrifice or child trafficking seems to get exposed. They don't go and smash the ovens of Arden, Delaware. Corruption has run amok. Society has fallen apart. Where is the evidence of light work or a counterbalance to the dark side? That's a great question. And, you know, Randolph joined various secret societies before starting his own. And he came across a lot of individuals in Europe that at this point in time seems unbelievable. You know, other magicians. It's rumored he came across Eliphas Levy walking the streets of Paris. Many, many rumors, obviously, which are too big to imagine, aside from very, you know, little proof of this. We have many verbal accounts of him meeting these people, kind of secretive in themselves, because a lot of these orders were not really readily accepted at the time. And one thing that isn't a secret is the fact that Randolph gave performances and never disappointed. So he would do these exhibitions, these public affairs. Sometimes they were performed in private residences. People would claim to see multitudes of lights around him and he would often produce credible materializations and sometimes human forms, different misty forms walking the audience, streaks of light, and many other spectacles that could not be explained. But no one ever got this dark feeling about it. And on his travels, he visited many countries, obviously, in order to create this mastership of this magical craft. One path that is interesting is there is the left-hand path that many magicians and people looking into this come across. And so my answer to that is, if there is a left-hand path, then there obviously must be a right-hand path. And I'm glad that you mentioned the <laughs> Doa Mesh, which is, you know, that medicine of immortality, which is primarily hashish. Hashish was highly regarded by Randolph, and he wrote that hashish perfectly illuminated him but the lucidity with the high, for example, infinitely exceeded anything he'd ever known before, even in trance state with no loss of will or self-consciousness. So I think he utilized that. And I happen to know the magical recipe you asked for. And that magical recipe for this doa mesh, which is translated from Arabic into the medicine of immortality, it's 300 grams of hashish, 250 grams of opium, 50 grams of henbane, and 20 grams of belladonna. But 
I digress. The big thing <laughs> is Randolph said he had been searching for years to find what he called the real secret of the wisdom tradition. So alchemists, hermeticists, mystics, the Illuminati, quote unquote, of all ages had basically used hashish or any of its family to liberate the imagination while reaching for what they called the philosopher's stone. And Randolph was enthusiastic and believed this was part of the tree of life and was a proponent of hashish use and the largest importer, not only before the Civil War, but I think in that book you quoted, Magia Sexualis, which was written with Maria Naglauska, he gives this formula and this recipe for this ointment that you mentioned to produce visions, to use with magic scrying mirrors. And he believed that this was sort of the key to unlock consciousness and put it in a realm where it could more easily connect. Hmm. I love it. Very impressive that you knew the recipe off the top of your head. But <laughs> this has uh, been a lot of fun. It was great talking to you again. This is probably really interesting to longtime listeners who got several unexpected updates on the work of previous guests. And I appreciate that. Give the people your links. And if you have any new avenues of study in the future, let us know what you're going to be looking into. You bet. Thanks for having me on, Greg. I'm pretty easy to find. Hero Paranormal is my podcast, a very small podcast, just things that interest me. You can find that at heroparanormal.com or Hero Paranormal on YouTube, as long as they allow me to be there, which seems like that's getting walking on thin ice there. And you can also check on the base camp, Space Wolf Research. That's at spacewolfresearch.com. You can also follow both of those on social media. They're on Facebook, et cetera, Instagram. And uh, I think, uh, yeah, that's about it. Awesome. Well, you are one of the good ones, man. Keep digging and take care. All right. Thank you. And boom goes the dynamite, kicking off December with a trip back to the old Skinwalker Ranch with exactly the right guy to do it. As I mentioned, Ryan and I have kind of stayed in touch from time to time, and he sent over leads on a few people that did become THC guests. Of them, I think Ryan Musgrave Evans, talking about these beans being crypto-terrestrials with high technology, managing the ancient earth farm and their free-range corn-fed human livestock, was my favorite. His book, Children of Orion, was a good read with some very unique takes in a crowded space of, yeah, we've heard that before. So I appreciated it a lot. Add in the fact that when I would ask him, well, how could you know such detailed stuff? His reply is, well, they come to me. I have my own experiences with them. I am a contactee. I thought it became even more compelling. But then there were also a few people that Ryan had interviewed on Hero Paranormal that I thought, well, interesting, but maybe we don't do a full two hours with each of them. Instead, maybe I just get Ryan back and we talk about them in an interview with him, along with some updates from the property and his latest thoughts on what we might be calling the Skinwalker Trickster now. I know there's a lot of conversation about it. It is a weird place, no doubt. If you have gotten a chance to pick up Dr. Greg Little's last book with Andrew Collins, Origins of the Gods, there is a photo in there in Andrew Collins' section that he took himself at Skinwalker Ranch of something in the sky, and it's compelling. And I do believe that there's enough going on there that a researcher could go out for a week and capture something pretty extraordinary. But I did try to press Ryan a bit more for details, and I think he gave us some good stuff. As I sort of mentioned, we were really going to focus this episode around PB Randolph, but we got to talking and that content almost didn't make it into the first hour at all. Sometimes I think two hours is really a long time. It's basically a feature length movie. And I wonder if maybe I'm asking too much of the guests or even asking too much of listeners to care about one interview that's two hours long. But then when I'm recording them, I usually think the time flies. 
And it's hard to believe that the vast majority of listeners are only getting the first hour. Not trying to segue right into the sales pitch, but days like today really do feel like we were just getting started 60 minutes in. And we're here, so I guess I'll just do that part of the thing now. In the second hour, we got into digging deeper on the Lightworkers premise. Of course, Ryan said, if there's a left-hand path, then there must be a right-hand path. And I don't disagree that there is a path. I'm just not convinced there are very many organized groups walking it when it comes to something like the White Hats or a secret society that's keeping the bad guys from destroying the world. Obviously, I know there are positive applications of magic. We talk about it all the time. But when it comes to light workers, my thought is just that maybe they aren't so organized. I think of them as more of a decentralized network of people working on their own energy fields. The Frodo Baggins thing that Gordon would talk about. Just making the most positive ripples in the world and even simple things can end up having like this butterfly effect that amplifies more positivity into the world, and that makes it harder for the capstone cabal to do its job. But Ryan made some interesting points about potentially high-level people who seem like they might be bad guys on the surface, but in secret might be actually pumping the brakes on elite agendas in some way, in their own way. You know, we've seen that character type in certain films where... They seem like a soldier or a good lieutenant, and then they just turn at the right time, and they help the hero when the hero really needed a person in that position. And I think that's an archetype that isn't just from Hollywood. I think it exists in the real world, even when people just have a crisis of consciousness in a particular moment. Maybe they didn't even wake up thinking they were going to help a good guy. I just think the universe kind of breaks good. And sometimes people, even bad people, are inspired to goodness in moments. And you never really know what's in someone's heart either. And all that said, I do just kind of wince when we talk about an organized shadow group that is working against the elite. It's just one of those savior motifs that I would rather avoid. Because I just don't know, I guess. And that part was interesting, but we also got into Scrying Mirrors, Sacrifice and the Skinwalker Entity, Space as an Altar, some other researchers that Ryan has interviewed who have connected Skinwalker Ranch to the Hollow Earth. You know, I like that. And then probably the most compelling thing we talked about was the blue dirt. It's kind of like the black goo, but it's a whole different thing. And maybe it activates ships, and maybe there's some alchemy involved, but the blue dirt was... Something I've yet to hear anywhere else. Ryan also gave us another example of where we might have seen Robert Guffey's Camellio Tech. And we talked about the prospect of weaponizing paranormal phenomenon or the effects of some of those things. We talked about Ryan's thoughts on Brandon Fogel. Fogel, 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 I don't know. It's a name I read quite often. But I haven't seen the show or anything, so I don't really hear it said. But Ryan's thoughts on this Brandon Fugel guy and the Skinwalker show was a part of the Plus episode. Then we got into a weird tangent about CRISPR, the CIA, and the Woolly Mammoth, and a little story about remote viewing Amelia Earhart. And spoiler alert for the free listeners, but apparently she was some sort of spy according to these remote viewing sessions, and it just makes me think about how we have these people whose names match their stories a little too well, like Bernie Madoff making off with everybody's money, Stephen Paddock shooting a bunch of people who were in a Paddock-like situation, Sam Bankman-Fried, who seems like this patsy who was placed at FTX when it collapsed to be the fall guy. And then you have this potential spy, Amelia Earhart, who goes missing in the air. Now, if a lot of these people were spies or patsies or connected in some way, you'd expect them to not be using the real name, and then hence the name actually has something with their mission or task. It's, it's an odd world, you know? But the Plus Show had a lot to like. Do yourself a favor. If you're listening to THC, just get the full 
episodes. Start with the seven-day free trial, plug the RSS feed right into whatever app you use to listen, and get in the game. We keep it ad and sponsorship free for a reason. A man's got to make money, but I think I want to do this for the people who appreciate it and get my income that way. Have you heard about this established titles scandal? It's all the rage for the people who do listen to other podcasts not to go on a huge tangent, but this company, Established Titles, has been saying that you can buy a little square plot of land in Scotland, and then, because of the Scottish custom, you can then use the title Lord or Lady in your name. Well, this company came on the scene and did ads with so many different podcasters, Ben Shapiro, Logan Paul, several other ones. I heard this ad everywhere. And it turns out to be a complete sham company. You're giving them money for a piece of paper. There is no land. And the Scottish government actually said when there was inquiries that, no, this does not qualify for our custom of being a lord or a lady. So it's a silly company. It's kind of harmless, but they're definitely lying about what the product is, and so many podcasters just read the ad because who cares? And there might be examples that aren't so innocent. How many of these podcasts talk about supplements or even sell blue chews? Yeah, it's all funny. Let's sell the dick pill because then I can make a few lowbrow jokes about it. These podcasters, in a lot of cases, are cashing in the trust you have in them to sell products they don't know anything about. And I hope they're proud of themselves, but we're going to see more and more of that kind of thing as time goes on. And I am just happy to have never gone down that road. I get offers all the time. Hey, based on your listenership, we think you could make X amount by promoting this product. It's like, I don't do that. You know, some people cast a lot of shade about, oh, this guy, he's just trying to make money. He puts half of his content behind a paywall, but I think it's better than the alternative. And we all have to have a job of some kind. So this is my job. I built it myself. This is how I do it. People get stingy with $8 when it comes to this type of content. Podcasts are supposed to be free, but we burn 8 bucks in all sorts of ways. We tip a waitress 8 bucks for a single meal. And I'm saying you give me an $8 tip and you get twice as much content. There's no better deal. (laughs) I didn't really mean to spin it or go off on this weird tangent, but when these scam companies pop up in podcasting, I just have to mention it as a sort of pat on the back to the way I do things and why I do it this way. But anyway, getting back to the content here for the real OGs, I think it was fun to have some of the material in this episode bump up against some old classics like the show with Jay Parker or the one with Robert Guffey. The stuff about Bigelow's Big Pivot made me start to wonder if Bigelow consciousness studies could be code for magic. Consciousness studies sounds a lot more broad. You're not going to call it occult studies or ritual investigations, but if you know about magic, the wink, wink, nod, nod, is that consciousness clearly plays a role and might be a key part of the mechanisms behind it, so I could see that being true. He tried going outward with Bigelow Aerospace, and now he's going inward, baby. That would make sense to me. But these are some of the eternal mysteries, and I try to make sure we're being creative and coming at them from different angles when we cover these things. It's hard not to just return to the well of ideas, and I don't know how much closer we get to a solve, but I'm intrigued, and so I do try to make sure we're not just rehashing the same ideas over and over and getting at least something fresh, and I think today qualifies. You know, I've been very big on the plasma thing since I first heard about it because first, when you think about aliens, it's like, oh, maybe there are fairies or some kind of elemental that's always been here. Great. Or maybe there's spirits. And then it's like, well, what does that even mean? And then you're like, maybe plasma's involved. Maybe that's why Eric Dollard created one in the lab. Maybe it's a portal. Maybe it's a vehicle of some kind. Maybe that's why these ships people see in the sky are always covered in these crazy bright lights and doing these crazy Christmas light-esque patterns with their lighting. Maybe you're seeing the plasma. I don't know. 
but I will forever enjoy mulling this stuff over. So big thanks to Ryan and congrats to him on getting Space Wolf research off the ground. If this kind of episode is your jam, Ryan's on this thread week after week on Hero Paranormal, just so you know. In higher side news, not a lot to say, just trying to hang on through this holiday season. We have had several guests in previous months talk about supply chain issues and food shortages and a big collapse. And things are certainly fragile and shaky out there. But I think all things considered, we are chugging along. I get that feeling a lot, though. It's not that some of our guests are wrong. They just need to extend their timeline out a bit more in a lot of cases. So much of this stuff often moves way slower than expected. So I'm not saying we're through the woods, but I'm certainly not going to complain that society hasn't collapsed as predicted, right? Screws are tighter than usual for a lot of people, I won't deny that. Cracks are certainly showing, but it's not full-blown broken yet, and I'll take it. Let's check that calendar. If you're feeling a bit down this December, if you'd like to change your situation and shuffle up your friend group, either make a THC event or show up to one near you. Here's what we got going on for the rest of the year. December 8th, we got the LA Truth Meetup at Flame International Restaurant. December 10th, we got one going on in Pachogi, New York. I think it's the Long Island Bar Crawl, okay? Let's just say Long Island. Also December 10th, Gray Bull, Wyoming at Bob's Diner. Also December 10th, Vancouver, Washington. Going to Shanahan's Pub and Grill. Also, December 10th, the Anti-Vaxmas 2 at Gilligan's Irish Pub in Glendale, California. December 11th, Asheville, North Carolina. December 17th, Fayetteville, New York. And I think that does it. The rest look like they're popping off in January, so consider it. It's as simple as going to HiresideMeetups.com, making a quick account, and adding your event to the mix. Nobody should feel lonely in the holiday season, and this is just one potential avenue for changing your situation if it needs changing. Have a good December, be good to each other, and don't let yourself get overly blackpilled. Who does that really serve, you know? <sighs> well, much love, guys. Thanks for listening. I've done my part. Your move, Invisible College Secret Keepers, Plasma Beans of the Landscape, and Desert Tricksters of the Unitaw Basin. Your fucking move. From space it was falling, its light started calling, it's making crop circles again. Just as I was looking up, it showed me all the hidden stuff, and now I'm all enlightened and zen. Waking up the masses is hard. Silver ships are coming yard by yard Now I'm not asleep, don't obey the elite Gotta be to the head Now I start to wonder, now we're not the sheep That they bred us to be Gotta be to the head Now we start to wonder, now we start to wonder Since the visitors set me straight I encourage you to go When you see the saucers glow One by one we'll all end up awake Enlightening the masses is hard Silver ships are coming yard by yard Now we're not asleep Don't obey the elite Got a beam to the head Start to wonder, no, we're not the sheep that they bred us to be. Got a beam to the head. Now we start to wonder, now we start to wonder, now we start to wonder, now we start to wonder. Sky. Just as the system starts to die, cabals hate it when we make it. So they'll break it and next round they'll erase it. It's a big loop. What can we do? Still, it's time we had another. Cause we're not the sheep that they bred us to be. Got a beam to the head. Now we start to wonder. Now we're Now we start to wonder
That is another show complete. Remember, as much as you enjoyed this, which is just the free first hour, I hope you'll become a Plus member to hear the full two-hour interviews. You also can engage with other Plus members in the comments and the forums, and you'll find your answer to one of the most common questions I get, which is where can I find those cover songs that you use at the end of the show? Well, they are free downloads for Plus members too. And without Plus members, I can't hire the occasional musician to bring these odd cover song ideas to fruition. Plus members are how I'm able to do what I do without ads and without the big machine being on my back. We can fit so much more into a two-hour interview, and I do my best to make it worth your time and money. The conversation only gets deeper, weirder, and more controversial in that private hour. How could it not the way things are going? But the best way to sign up is at thehiresidechats.com where new first-time subscribers always get a free seven-day trial because I'm just that confident. There's no PayPal on the website, but if you need to use PayPal, then sign up through Patreon and you get all the same episodes. Our website is a credit or debit system, but you can also scope out the other options like a few various cryptos, cash or check mailed to the P.O. Box, and I'll even barter with most people if you have your own business and produce something nice that my wife or kid or taste buds might like. But the architects of consensus reality have made it clear that these themes and topics aren't really welcome on the main stage. And so this is how we secure a little counterculture corner for ourselves, and I hope you'll join Plus because that is the only way it works. Besides, you can cancel anytime right on your profile page. The most common concern I hear is people just being unsure if THC Plus will work with their podcast app, and the answer is probably yes. But if not, we have several high-level app recommendations for whatever phone you use, and the website is made for mobile too. We're trained to tip a waitress for bringing us a sandwich, but that tip doesn't give you access to a second sandwich. Really, I'm not asking for any more than that, and I think I offer a better service. Come get your second serving of tasty conspiracy goodness in exchange for that small token of your appreciation. Beyond that, let it also be known that we have grown and survived as long as we have by word of mouth. I don't care so much about social media likes or follows, but tell the right people about THC. And not just listeners, but the high-level figures who are better suited to sit down with me than most other hosts. And if you can help me with any of these things, I can work to bring you better shows, which is just a win-win for both of us. Informative, entertaining, and action-packed. It also never hurts to thank a guest you liked if you have the time either. We want them to know people are listening, so they're willing to come back down the road too. Thank you for spending some time with me, and cheers to a better tomorrow.